We are Gold Ivy, a health company dedicated to simplifying health and wellness. Tune in as we search to find the deep, real, and raw truth. We're here to talk big, no room for small talk. It is our mission to inspire, seek growth, simplify the action steps, and build confidence. You decide what works for your daily life and how to transform our lessons into your gold. Are you ready to step into your power? Now is the time. Join us on the fearless pursuit of self-discovery and growth. This is Ivy Unleashed, a Gold Ivy production. If you're a regular listener of the show or you follow us on social media, you know I, Brooke, just ran my first marathon and Andrea ran her 22nd state and her goal to run a marathon in every state. How did I go from barely getting out of bed to being able to run 26.2 miles, a customized training plan, and coaching with Andrea? With my health concerns, it was important for me to make sure I crossed that finish line safely and confidently. We are so excited to announce that we are now offering customized training plans. Whether you're wanting to run a 5K, 10K, half, or full marathon, we've got you covered. Get your customized training plan plus coaching to get you race ready and keep you motivated along the way. Prior to receiving your training plan, you will meet with me, Andrea, for a 15 minute call to discuss your goals, race details, and schedule your three coaching calls. You will receive a training plan for your race, tailored to your schedule, endurance, and cross training preferences like yoga, biking, strength, or whatever movement you enjoy. Coaching throughout your training will provide accountability, safety, and inspiration to keep you pursuing your training and race goals. With Andrea, you will connect your mind and body to maximize your race experience. And if you're looking for a custom training plan without coaching, we're offering that as well. Head over to the shop page on our website, goldivyhealthco.com, to learn more and get you across that finish line. When was the last time you had a pinch me moment? We recently reached out to the brilliant author, highly regarded performance coach, and motivational speaker, Alan Stein Jr., to let him know we appreciated his work, and he responded. Not only did Alan respond, but he also offered to sit down with us in studio, work out with us, and let us attend his keynote speech in Minneapolis. Alan Stein Jr. spent 15 plus years working with the highest performing basketball players on the planet, including NBA superstars Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and Kobe Bryant. Now, as an experienced keynote speaker and author of Raise Your Game and Sustain Your Game, Alan shares his gold in new ways. In this episode, you'll hear his brilliant message to find value in the fundamentals to manage stress, avoid stagnation, and beat burnout. He will inspire you to get in your reps when doing your internal work, whether it's creating awareness, building patience, or facing your insecurities. So get ready for an incredible speaker to help you lean into the fundamentals so you can bring yourself closer to the person you want to be and sustain your game long term. And tune in Thursday, September 15th for part two, where Alan dives deep into burnout, grind culture, and abundance mindset and made our abs hurt from laughing so hard. And now to today's episode of Ivy Unleashed. Ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a ride. We have a very special guest in the house. First time in Minnesota? No, I've been to Minnesota before. Okay, well, he's back. And that's Alan Stein Jr. Alan, welcome to Ivy Unleashed. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to be here. It's lovely to be with you both. We This is sur- a surreal moment for us because you're in my house. You're in, <laughs> where, you're in where we do what we do. And not only is he here to record with us, but he also joined us for a workout this morning, a move workout. What did you think? It was awesome. You, you guys left me in the dust. I had trouble keeping up. <laughs> it, was, it was great though. It was high energy. It was fun. Great movements. I enjoyed it. And yeah. uh, we're very sweaty. So if you're watching on YouTube, that is why. Yeah, I'm probably glowing right now. So we found Alan by listening to one of our idols, Ed Milet. And Alan was on to talk about his incredible book, Sustain Your Game. So um, if you're looking on YouTube, Sustain Your Game by Alan Stein Jr., an awesome book that Brooke and I needed. We needed this book so badly because we're chasing our dream. And you're basically helping us figure out how to keep 
doing this in the long term. So thank you so much for your book. Oh, my pleasure. Well, thank you guys for investing the time in reading it. Mm -hmm. You have a podcast and you're a keynote speaker today. You have a lot going on. So how is life for you kind of traveling, being an author, speaking for these huge corporations? How's that going? Life is fantastic. Uh, at 46 years old, life has never been better. I always like to say that that I'm not speaking from a place of mastery on anything that I share on page or anything that I share on stage. Uh, these are all things that that I'm still challenged by, I'm still struggling with, but I'm making progress and I'm proud of that progress. I'm proud of the path that I'm on. Uh, and I'm slowly starting to figure some things out that work well for me. And um, one of the things that I said on Ed's show that I've gotten the most feedback from was the mantra that I live by, which is a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. And that's ultimately how I view my work uh, is trying to help people light their candles. But I'm doing it through the things that have been challenging me for my entire life. So I'm so glad that it resonates with you guys. I'm so glad that Ed show brought us together. I'm thankful to be here. Uh, and every time I have an opportunity to share, whether it's on stage or whether it's an intimate setting like this for a podcast, I, I relish the opportunity to talk about things I'm passionate about. Yeah. And we have so much, so much to get into. Awesome. Let's start first with the magic of this book. So you, your first book, Raise Your Game, and then you wrote Sustain Your Game. So what sparked what inspired Sustain Your Game? Well, to piggyback on what I just said a moment ago, I write the book that I need to be reading myself. Uh, I find it equal parts uh, liberating and therapeutic to be writing and researching about the things that I need help with. So when I decided to write Raise Your Game, I had just left the basketball training space after almost 20 years working in that business and decided to become a corporate keynote speaker and wanted to figure out what, what were the traits that I needed to ascend to the top of that craft and not playing the comparison game. I have no interest in being better than another speaker. I have a very strong interest in being the best that I'm capable of. So I wanted to try and figure out what are some of these principles of high utility that I learned through the game of basketball that I could now apply to the speaking craft. And that was the reason for writing Raise Your Game. So Raise Your Game was all about climbing that proverbial mountain. Um, now, I don't think I'm ever going to reach the summit. I think I'll be on the climb for my entire life. And that's a preference. I, I enjoy the pursuit and I enjoy the climb. But I started to figure out that there was a slight difference between what you need to do to reach the top and what you need to do to stay there for long periods of time. But the most important part of that is with a sense of joy and fulfillment. So how, how can I love my work as much at 46 as I did at 36 and at 26? And how can I keep that going in the right direction so I'll love it even more at 56 mm -hmm. and 66? And I came to the conclusion that the three things that undermine our ability to sustain high performance and sustain enjoyment and fulfillment are stress, stagnation, and burnout. Uh, and those are things that I've wrestled with my entire life. So I figured let's unpack them in this book. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, th thankful I did. It's been a great journey. And I mean, even since the time of writing the book, now just being in the process of discussing it with others, um, I'm still continuing to learn. And uh, I can say without question, I handle stress now consistently better than at any other point in my life. Um, and I no longer fear stagnation or burnout because I believe I have the tools in place to ward both of them off. Doesn't mean I'm immune to them. And certainly doesn't mean that I don't feel stressed but I feel stressed less consistently than I ever have before. And that's leads me to believe I'm at least moving in the right direction. Yeah. Something that I think you do really well too is applying these concepts to anybody. Mm -hmm. Like I think it starts from basketball and you can learn a lot of life lessons, I think from basketball and sports in general, sports in general. Yeah. yeah the grit that you need. And I think, you know, a stay at home mom could read your book and say, you know, how do I not get burned out in this? You know, I think anybody can read this book and think about getting aligned with what they want out of their life and then continually doing that so that they don't burn out. Well, I appreciate you saying that because ultimately that's my goal. Again, from page or from stage, my goal is to translate the principles of highest utility to people that don't share the love of basketball that I have. Um, and, and I say this with great humility. If I'm talking to a group of people that love basketball, that's too easy. <laughs> like that's shooting fish in a barrel for me because that is my language. That is, there's no problem with that. It's making sure that I can apply those lessons or teach those lessons to people that don't love basketball, that don't love sport. You know, I, I used to stay on stage kind of as a, a joke. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you know the difference between LeBron James or Rick James. <laughs> My job is to make sure that you walk away with lessons that can impact your life. And that's, I take a lot of pride in that. And I think that's part of being a leader, uh, being a communicator is being able to take these 
ideas and, and share them across the board. But then I've also tried to make sure that I step out of my bubble of only learning from the game of basketball and read, watch, listen to, and research people from all different walks of life. And I, I have an absolute blast doing that. And you're damn good at it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Reading your book, even the way all the stories that you share with the professionals that you've worked with, Kevin Durant, for example, but more so just all of the coaches in your life and the stories that you share. Yes, they're around basketball and sports, but they're so applicable to anyone. And when we, re when we reached out, it was moms and women. They need to hear this. They need to hear about how to manage stress in a way that isn't overwhelming. Our whole goal with Ivy Unleashed and, and Gold Ivy is to simplify making people feel good. Yes. Right? And you break it up in three parts, which are awesome because whether you're dealing with stress or stagnation or burnout, there's so many different practical tools that you can apply, but your work really starts with the fundamentals. So let's get into that, the importance of fundamentals and why it's so hard for people to master the fundamentals. Well, this stems back from the first time I met Kobe Bryant and I had a chance to watch one of his early morning workouts and I'll, I'll kind of fast forward. I have the full story on YouTube if anyone ever wants to, to see it, but the lesson I learned from Kobe, which I believe is the foundation of my life's philosophy now is that the best never get bored with the basics, that if you want to be good in any area of your life, and this is where it has practical application everywhere. You want to be a better spouse. You want to be a better parent. You want to be a better lawyer. You want to play the piano at a higher level. It doesn't matter. You have to learn to stick to the basics and the fundamentals. And that is difficult. Uh, you know, I'll readily acknowledge that often in any area of life, the basics are monotonous, they're mundane, and they can get boring. And I also believe that, that society is wired to make us feel that we should always be chasing what's flashy and what's sexy and what's new and what's hot. So we've got, you know, the, the temptation to feel that the basics are boring and then over here, we're constantly being tempted by what's new and what's shiny. I think that's the reason that many people kind of skip over the basics. And I know in my life, anytime I'm not performing at a level that I believe that I'm capable of, whether that's as a father or as a keynote speaker, once I have some, some self-reflection and some introspection, I can usually acknowledge I've started to wane away from the basics and I have to get back to them. So the goal is to never leave them in the first place. But because we're human, we're fallible, we're flawed, that's going to happen occasionally. So I make sure that I'm always going back and drilling in on the fundamentals. And one point to that, it doesn't mean that you only do the basics. It just means they're the foundation to which the rest of the house is built so you never leave them. So in a game like basketball, uh, your, your footwork and your shooting mechanics are the basic movement patterns. So you do them for 15 to 20 minutes every single day. Then you graduate to more advanced skills and drills and techniques and so forth. So it doesn't mean you only do the basics. It just means you don't leave them. And the, the, the practical takeaway for everyone listening to this is figure out what area of your, your life you're trying to up-level and then get crystal clear on what are the basics of that and how can I work on them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a huge believer that one of the basics for human connection. So this would be whether you're trying to improve your intimate relationship, uh, improve a relationship with a colleague or coworker, improve your connection with your children is what you two are doing so beautifully now, which is actively listening. Listening is a, a massive connective tissue. So if you want to improve any relationship in your life immediately, learn to become a better listener. Mm -hmm. That's one of the basic building blocks. Well, to get better at anything, you need to get in reps. You need to practice. So we all need to practice listening, mm -hmm. now, which is wonderful because there's no shortage of opportunities to listen <laughs> because everybody likes to talk, you know, on social media, everywhere, people like to talk, but practice the skill of active listening. Um, I know that's one I've had to really work hard at over the last several years because I was an awful listener for the first 40 years of my life. It wasn't because I didn't care. It was because, I, you know, I had some deep rooted insecurities. So I wanted to be liked and feel worthy. So I was always spending time figuring out what could I say to add to this conversation? How could I prove to you that I was smart? How could I one up you? And, and, and that's, that will actually erode your connection with other human beings. So once I learned to kind of take a deep breath, actually and genuinely care what other people have to say and practice the skill of actively listening, it's getting better. I'm not a world-class listener yet, <laughs> but I'm better than I was before. And that's all I can ask. I think that's a tricky balance too. When you are a speaker, you have a podcast, like your job is to speak. And same with us too. You know, we do have content we want to get to in this episode, but Brooke and I always say like, let's just be curious. Like, let's just see what Alan has to say. Like, if we don't get to this stuff, whatever, like maybe we'll try again another time. But it's so true. Like, I do think it's tricky when also you're a high performer, you do want 
a good speech or you do want a good podcast episode, but the magic really is in like the moment Mm -hmm. of what's going to happen. I know one of your fundamentals has been meditation Mm -hmm. and it's something that we've been throwing into our routines too. And so, uh, could you just talk about some of your fundamentals? Like when you are like, let's simplify, let's get back to the basics. Like what are your go-tos? Sure. And let's, I want to backtrack real quick on listening because it is interesting because I am paid to speak. I mean, literally that is what people pay me to do. Mm -hmm. However, it's the listening that happens beforehand that ensures that what I'm going to say when I speak hits the target. So, so later today, I'm so thankful you guys will be joining me for the keynote that I'm giving to uh, 60 different uh, franchisors and franchisees and a variety of different brands. And I remember vividly a couple of weeks ago being on the pre-event call with the gentleman that's running this event. And I, I didn't keep a stopwatch, but I'm willing to bet that if I recorded that conversation, he spoke for 90% of it. I spoke for 10 because I was just asking question after question. Who's going to be in the audience? What are their biggest challenges? What are their pain points? What things are going well? What do they need to hear? What behaviors do they need to change? What can I do to make this a home run? What can, so it was just question after question, and he did most of the talking and did a brilliant job sharing everything that I needed to know so that I could take my notes and then customize a keynote. So today, when I'm the one doing the talking, I'm hoping it hits the mark. And uh, same thing in anything. We, we were joking off uh, before we hit record. I've been on a few dates recently. And during most dates, I'm pretty quiet. I, I am genuinely fascinated. And I like to get to know the other person. I want to hear about their journey. Um, so on most dates, and, and it's not that I'm shy. And it's not that I, I don't mind talking about myself. But I, I have a genuine curiosity. So I really try and practice the skill of listening you know, in as many opportunities as I can. And the one that's been the biggest difference maker is with kids, like listening to your kids, letting them share uh, has been a big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I even think about in your book, you mentioned picking someone's brain, right? (laughs) And so business wise, (laughs) knowing how can I be of service to you? And so coming to those relationships with, hey, here's how we think we could serve and help you and how just more authentic and the rapport that comes from that. So I think whether it's a business relationship or a personal relationship coming from a place of how can I help you? It's not about you. It's the we, but kind of putting that other person first. Yes. And that's one area that I've also had to make a major flip because I, I didn't navigate the first 40 years of my life through that same paradigm. I I was incredibly selfish Every time I would meet someone, I was unconsciously thinking, what can they do for me? How can I not take advantage of in a malicious or a manipulative Mm -hmm. way, but, but who do you know that you can introduce Mm -hmm. me to? What, what can you do to add value to me? And once again, this is all rooted in insecurity. If I feel like part of me is missing that needs to be completed, then I'm going to be searching for it somewhere else. If I already know that I'm not broken, then I can just come from a place of service. So these... I often speak as if, as if there's been two Allen Stein juniors, there's the previous one and there's the current one. And I realize that all of them make up who I am. And I've, you know, this sounds really kind of foo-foo, but I've forgiven the previous knucklehead for some of those mistakes. That's just where I was on my journey. Yeah. You know, at that time I was still doing the best I could with what I had, mm-hmm. where I was. I just didn't have a certain level of awareness and I certainly didn't have the emotional intelligence to be able to navigate that. So now, yeah. And I also realize it feels great to be of service. Lighting someone's candle certainly helps them, but boy, it feels really good to do that. So there are so many ways that I am now that I wasn't before, which is always fascinating because like when I meet two wonderful people like you, you only know me as now, Mm -hmm. but I have some people in my life that have known me before and and that's an interesting dynamic too. So always trying to level up and and Mm -hmm. make these improvements and uh, yeah, and that part I'm enjoying. What shifted? Yeah, good question. Uh, Boy, a variety of things. I, I think when I hit 40, that was kind of a big eye-opening moment. You know, you start to question your mortality, started going in for some therapy and some things around a divorce. Yeah, it just like this perfect storm. You know, within a couple of years, you get divorced, you go through therapy, you've got young kids that are getting older. I decided to leave a 20-year vocation and jump into another pool and do something completely different. So it was a massive shakeup and uh, all for the good. And it wasn't easy. I can make it sound easy now. It wasn't easy going through it, but that was the rite of passage. And mm-hmm. uh Yeah. I always say it, it all comes down to awareness. You know, you'll never fix something you're unaware of. You'll never improve something you're oblivious to. So you have to have that level of awareness. And I didn't have it for 40 years. You know, if you would have asked me these same questions 10 years ago, 
you know, I would have thought I had my stuff together. <laughs> I would have thought, yeah, I just didn't know. And uh, so I'm thankful now that I know. And part of that is surrounding yourself with people that can help you see your blind spots, mm -hmm. you know. I if you would have asked me 10 years ago, did I think I was a good listener? I would have said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I've heard every word that you've said, but I'm not really listening to it. Mm -hmm. While your lips are moving, I'm formulating my response or, you know, many times I would turn, because I'm very competitive, would turn conversations almost in adversarial. Like, how can I one up you? Mm -hmm. Like if, if we're just having a friendly debate on something, I'm spending way more time thinking about how I'm going to beat you in this conversation instead of how I'm going to learn from you mm -hmm. and learn your perspective. So yeah, it's, it's all part of the journey. Hi, I'm Britt, the creator and founder of PNTY, granola bars that say please and thank you. I started this company to remind people the power of manners and respect. Even when we don't agree with someone or care for them, we can still show them respect. And through that respect, we can strengthen our community. We love your granola and bars, and their names are so cute. The Golden Rule, Pardon Me, You're Welcome, Sharing is Caring. We're curious why you decided to share this message with granola bars specifically. It's a fun, easy, daily way to share an important message. My products are especially crafted in a way to be inherently good for you pantry friendly ingredients, well balanced and packaged in an earth friendly way. It's full circle. Take care of yourself, be mindful of your community, think about your earth. They are simply a daily reminder of that. Love that. Your yes please granola has officially made me a breakfast person. It's hands down the best granola I've ever had. I pair it with Greek yogurt, berries and chia. And I look forward to it every morning with my coffee. I love that it's gut friendly, being gluten free, and has a dairy free option too. Britt, where can our listeners find your delicious granola and what kind of deal can you give them? You can find me on Instagram at PTY Granola Co. and order from my shop page, www.ptygranolacompany.com. Ivy Unleashed listeners can use this promo code Gold Ivy at checkout for a 10% discount. Amazing. Thank you, Britt. Nice use of manners, Brooke. Thank you. <laughs> I truly treasure new connections and I'm so excited when I get to make granola bars and I'm able to share a snack food that I believe wholeheartedly in. So grab my granola bars and granola whenever you want, but make sure to use your manners. Please and thank you. I think something I'm hearing too is the desire to want to have that awareness. Right. And I think that comes from two crises a lot. You're at a point where shit, something has to shift. Something has to change. Yes. And the only way to change is to do the hard work and to get that awareness, taking that reflection, slowing down to even know what am I doing that isn't serving me? Yeah. And some of it just comes with life experience and mm -hmm. maturity. You know, I'm, I'm happy. I've kind of quote unquote seen the light, you know, at, at 40 because some people don't see it till 60. Some people never see it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing is you have to learn how to let go. You know, I talk about the principle all the time of move to the next play. Do you dwell on the 40 years that you were less aware with lower emotional intelligence? Or do you dwell on the fact that that's no longer me? Now I've got potentially 40 more years where I can live a much more, you know, engaging and fulfilling and curious type of life. So it all just depends on what you focus on. And still to this day, I have my good days and my bad. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, it's no one's ever immune or cured from any of this stuff. It's all about incremental progress and consistency. Those are the two most important things for me. Mm. So I still have off days. I still have bad moods. I still feel lousy at times, but those times are a lot less frequent and certainly a lot less consistent than they've been at any other time. Yeah. Something that Brooke and I struggle with with business is, you know, when you're reading like entrepreneur books, like yours is different. Yours is like what we are really drawn to, to not burn out, right? That's like what we're going for. But a lot of the books and a lot of the people are like, go hard, you don't sleep, you push, push, push. And they are successful. Like think of your first, you know, 10 years of being a performance coach, like very successful, huge connections, your ability to go, go, go and make all those connections. And maybe you did feel selfish or maybe you think you were, but it worked. Like you are connected to some huge people and have had great success. And so that's something we struggle with is like, we're trying to sustain our game here, Yeah. but like 
at what cost? Like, would we have made more money in the last couple of years if we pushed harder and didn't sleep? You know, or do we do this different? And like, literally your book is like telling us we're on the right path because we are trying to pepper in rest and meditation and manage our stress and, and come from alignment. And so I'm curious your thoughts on that, like grind versus rest, the balance of that with business. Well, well, I'll ask you, do you think you would have made more money or accumulated more listeners or followers if you would have pushed harder over the last 10 years? Because I don't necessarily know that you would have. You may have, yeah. but I don't know that it's, it's guaranteed. You know, the, I, I've, one of the things that I did learn from the strength and conditioning world is that you want, you want to do the minimal amount of work needed to create the maximum effect. And mm -hmm. when I say minimal, a lot of people, they click on the mental cruise control and they think, oh, that means easy or that means taking shortcuts. No, I mean, if, if the workout we did this morning was phenomenal, really, really, really hard. It was 30, what, 32 minutes long. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Now, could we have gone for 40 minutes? Possibly, but would we have made any more progress adding eight minutes to that? I, I don't necessarily know that we would have, you know, if, uh, if we all went out this evening and we all had a bunch of cocktails and drinks and tomorrow, each one of us had a small headache, we would each take the minimum number of Advil necessary to remove the headache, not the maximum. You don't say I'm going to take 10 Advil to get rid of the headache if two gets rid of it. So I've always believed in doing the least amount possible from a volume standpoint. So I always thought that if my basketball players could come in and I could give them an amazing workout in 45 minutes and you two took 90 minutes and they got the exact same results, then my program would be superior because it's more time efficient. That would give them an extra 45 minutes to work on the skills of the game or to watch film, you know, because time is our most precious resource. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's part of the problem too. Not only is the hustle and grind culture, it's not sustainable. I don't necessarily know at, to a point that it's more effective. Um, I was talking with a coach one time. So I'm a huge Coach K fan, the recently retired coach at Duke, uh, who coached, you know, what was it, 42 years at Duke, won over 1,000 games, and he was a worker. I mean, he was, you know, even up until his last year, people would say he's working 60, 70, 80 hours per week. And this, I'm not saying this with judgment. He was doing what he wanted to do. But I asked a young coach and said, okay, if over 42 years, if Coach K worked five less hours per week, 52 weeks a year for 42 straight years. That's a significant amount of time. Do you think he would have won any fewer games than he won? And the coach said, no, probably not. I think he would have won the same. So that just makes you wonder. And that this is by no means a judgment of Coach K. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I consider him the GOAT, but it does, it makes you wonder. So for me, my goal is what's the minimum? It sounds weird saying it, mm -hmm. considering I'm in the quote unquote motivational space. Yeah. <clears throat> what is the minimal amount of work I can do each week to produce a maximum result. I'm not looking for shortcuts. I want to be the best I'm capable of on stage and on page. I want my podcast. Like I, I want those things to be extraordinary, but if I can be extraordinary in 25 hours a week versus 45 hours a week, that frees up 20 hours mm -hmm. to be with my children or to train for a race or to do a lot of other things that, that I'd like to do. So um, that's part of the, the hustle grind culture. Yeah. I think that comes back to something you talk a lot about is focus, mm -hmm. right? If you know you have 30 minutes to get this done, you are laser focused, you're getting it done. And that's what we've developed is, okay, we're working a full-time job on top of trying to build our business. And so we're chunking our time. And so we time block, yes. you know, exactly when you're getting the things done and then you're sticking true to that. You're doing it when you say you're doing it. So then that's your commitment to yourself and you're building confidence but it comes from being focused. And in today's world, it is so damn hard with all the distractions. So I think what you're saying is awesome if you have that focus. Yep. So I'm curious how you have focus. Well, the, the, yeah, I, I'm going to backtrack one mm -hmm. second. I know I keep backtracking. That's sorry. okay. To your podcast and I keep, I keep hitting the rewind button <laughs> on it. Um, the other thing I learned in strength and conditioning is you don't get stronger when you're in the weight room. You get stronger during the rest and recovery mm -hmm. period in between that if you decide to do a full body strength workout seven days a week, you're going to burn out. You're going to get injured and you're going to stagnate. You're not going to make progress. So you need to follow <clears throat> really intense work efforts with appropriate rest. Mm -hmm. That's how I view my work now. Cause I don't want this to be taken out of context. I believe in hard work and I will put my work ethic up against anyone's. 
It's just my on switch is not on 24 seven. My on switch is on for a few hours every day where I do have razor focus and I'm giving it my best effort, but then I turn it off so that I can rest my mind, body and my, my spirit Mm -hmm. so that I can come back and, and be even better. So that's the problem with the hustle grind culture is they never talk about the off. And when they do, it's kind of this, this almost male bravado chauvinistic like work hard play hard like yeah we'll work 16 hours a day and then we'll go out and we'll have some drinks like no that's not rest and recovery that's not how you become your best self the next morning that's how you burn yourself out Mm -hmm. so that that is a big part of it um from a focal standpoint really i've got a crystal clear vision of the person i'm trying to become and every decision i make i run through the filter of is this taking me closer to being that person or is it taking me further away From what I eat for breakfast to who I follow on Instagram to what I watch on Netflix, I ask myself, is this taking me closer to the person I want to be? And if the answer is yes, then maybe I'll decide to put some focus into Mm -hmm. it. If the answer is no, then I do my best to abstain or find something better. And I'm not looking to bat a thousand. Yeah, I, I don't mean every single thing that I eat is perfectly, you know, nutritious for me, but most of the things I eat are nutritious and feed my body. Like, and I, I have that approach with, with everything. So for me, that's the filtering system. Um, and then you can break that down into silos. So I have a, a certain goal that I'm trying to reach from a speaking standpoint. So I ask myself, is saying yes to this opportunity going to take me closer to reaching that speaking goal? If it is, I do it. If it's not, then I at least have a hesitation to decide whether or not it's, it's worth doing. And uh, that means you have to get good at saying no which is not something I've been mm-hmm. habitually good at for the first 40 years. I was a, a bona fide people pleaser, love saying yes, would often say yes to do something to satisfy your needs, even though they were completely contradictory to where I was trying to go. And then I felt frazzled. Then I felt like there's not enough time. Then I would get irritable. You know, there's just not enough time to get done what I want to get done. Well, yeah, because you've been saying yes to everybody else and you've been you know, helping them do what they're trying to accomplish. So now I've learned that you can say no um, with tact, with civility, with professionalism, with courtesy, you know, I appreciate the offer, but that's not a great fit for me right now, but I wish you the best with it. I mean, I literally cut and paste that into emails when people ask for opportunities that just aren't in the right fit and that's okay. And then many times I say, you know, this isn't the right fit for me right now, but please come back in six months because it may be then, you know, if my speaking schedule is really full one month, I don't have a lot of extra time to do people's shows and things like that. It doesn't mean that I don't want to do them. I know it'd be a wonderful conversation, but come back in December when my speaking load is a lot lighter and then I'll be happy to make time for you then. And most people are incredibly gracious about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love too that, you know, when you're saying yes to something that you're not super thrilled about, you're saying no to something that could be a lot more important. So it's like, if I'm saying yes to this, what am I saying no to? And is it even in that filter of that alignment? I love what you said about that of, you know, what is it? What type of person do I want to be? And is this aligning with that? And if it's not, I'm probably going to be resentful or have guilt or shame about it because I already know what I want to be doing and this is not it. Yeah. Well, so without getting too granular, uh, I'm 46. I, I know that I'm not promised the next 20 years, but if I keep taking care of myself, statistically, I should be around for another 20, let's hope. Uh, so I want the 66 year old Alan to be physically, mentally, and emotionally fit. All right. That's a pretty big umbrella. Uh, I want the 66 year old Alan to have a deep connection with his kids and his family and his friends. Again, pretty wide. And I want the 66 year old Alan to be doing work he considers meaningful and in service of others. So those are big. That's what I mean. I'm not getting too specific, Mm -hmm. but, but that pretty much covers everything that's important to me. That covers my physical, mental, and emotional health. That covers my relationships. That covers my vocation and where I'm choosing to put my energy. So now I just ask myself, is, is doing this taking me closer to being that person? But the beautiful part is I'm not postponing anything. I'm making decisions in the present moment for who I'm trying to be in the future. So on one level, I'm designing my future, but I'm reaping the benefits in the present. You know, the, I, again, I don't mean for this to sound like it's lacking humility, but the 46 year old Alan is physically, mentally, and emotionally fit, does have a great relationship with his kids and is doing work he considers meaningful and in service of others. So I'm doing those things now. It's not like I'm, I'm not making the mistake that a lot of people make of postponing their happiness. I will be happy when, when. and then you fill in the, the blank. When I get the next job, when we get the next house, when, when my kid can start you know, and there's obviously all sorts of landmarks with children. When I get, no, I'm not postponing anything. I'm as happy as can be right now, 
but I'm making these decisions and laying the bricks and the foundation to make sure that's who I am at 66 and then 76 and 86. And depending on how medicine goes, maybe 106, 126, <laughs> yeah. 156. He ain't we'll going see. nowhere. No, I'm not. We'll see. <laughs> well, what, what that sounds like to me is those habits and the rituals that you have. Like those are your fundamentals. And yes. you say, are, do the habits... Are the habits you have today on par with the dreams you have for tomorrow? Yes. Did I say that right? You, you nailed it. <laughs> One of my biggest professional honors is that quote hanging in, in Penn State's uh, training room. Um, and boy, now I know I realize I sound like such an a-hole with saying some of these things. Hopefully you guys have know, you know me well enough to know that I have a sarcastic sense of humor. But my favorite joke is the quote next to mine in the Penn State uh, training center is by Gandhi. So I just like telling everyone that I feel like, you know, Gandhi and I are on very similar levels. Hell yeah. Yeah. You know, I still have to go by Alan Stein Jr. He just goes by Gandhi. But, you know, they decided to take these two quotes and put them up. That's, that was Penn uh, State's decision, not I, mine. I love that you're talking about this because <laughs> uh, something that Brooke and I have been thinking, right? Like you coming here, like you are a very big deal. Like you have very big connections with very big people. You've had a very successful career. And I wonder what that's like to... Cause you're a very humble, personable, genuine, like person. Like we picked Alan up in our car today. We're like, what are we doing? How is he going to be in our car? And so I'm curious how that goes in life. When you have these huge connections, you're speaking at these big events and then you're trying to stay humble and grounded in like, I'm just Alan, you know, like how does that go and how to, how does that work in your brain? I very much appreciate the, the praise and the kind words that you just shared it it's almost like a cognitive dissonance. Like I, I almost, cause I don't view myself that way because I have people that I view that mm -hmm. way. So I've got a list of people that if I pick them up in my car, I'd be like, I can't believe this person's in, in my car. So everything is perspective. Everything is vantage point that, that we're all making these, these different comparisons. I mean, I've, I do have that lit. Like Ed Milet was one of them. It was surreal for me to be on Ed's show and sit down with him. That was unbelievable. I mean, I've been trying to track Ed down for three years to get on his show. I mean, that also shows the level of persistence I have. I can be somewhat of a relentless, unshakable pain in the ass when there's <laughs> something that I really want, but it took three years and it, it finally came to fruition. But, but here I am thinking that about him and it feels really weird that someone could possibly be thinking that about me. And along those same lines, I can promise you that Ed thinks that about a group of people as well. Mm -hmm. Now he's probably had a chance to meet them. So it's, it's just, it's vantage point, it's perspective. Um, I just know so many people have poured into me and so many people have lit my candle that I feel that I need to be a steward to pay that forward and to continue uh, to, to, light, to light more. But I mean, we all only see what we choose to share. So you guys see that I was on the Ed Milet show. You don't see that there's 20 other podcasts of Ed's size that either politely declined or never emailed me back, have no interest in me, have no idea who I am, and don't believe I would add any value to their show. And that's okay. I don't say that with an ounce of scorn. They're doing what's best for them. I'm trying to do what's best for me and my mission. And it's okay. I don't take it personal. So I've, I've learned some resilience. You know, I get, I get told no a lot more than I get told yes. For every speaking engagement I get, I get three or four that would say, no, thank you, you know, or you're not the right fit. And it's always funny when they say, you know, it's, it's not personal. I'm like, well, it's kind of personal. You're basically saying you don't want this face and words coming out of this mouth on your stage. <laughs> How could it get yeah. any more personal? I don't know that it could be more personal. I yeah. love that you said that. That's so important for people to understand, even just like social media in general, like you're seeing the highlight reel, right? And I think it's really important for successful people, for authors to say, I hear no all the time. Oh boy. You know? well, yeah. Well, the book is a, a book is a perfect example. So um, I'm proud of the, the people that I had a chance to speak to, to be in this book. Very proud. And I'm very thankful for the time they gave. I am not even remotely exaggerating that it is six to one, six no's for every single person that's in that book. So many times I've reached out now, and even of those six, maybe one or two of them have the courtesy to write back and say, you know, we don't have time. It's not a good fit for me at this time. Like, and I respect that. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of them, you just don't hear anything back. So also a lot of the way I guide my life, I don't like not hearing back from someone. I don't like being ghosted. I would prefer that someone just says, no, thank you. But I also realize that's being very selfish. That is, that is my preference. And it's not the universe's job to unfold, to meet all of my preferences. However, because I don't like the way it feels when someone doesn't return my email, I return, I've returned every single email I've ever received in the last 20 years, 
you know, and, and if anyone listening to this can prove to the contrary, please resend me the email because it means <laughs> I, it means I didn't get it. Maybe it got stuck in spam or whatever, lost in the ether. But I make sure to write someone back and 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 be honest and and so forth. Yeah. So for every interview that was done in that book, six people told me no. For the speaking engagement you guys will get to see today, six people have said I'm not the right fit. So that means my goal every year is to do 60 paid speaking engagements. So that means I'm hearing no 300 times or whatever. My math isn't great. That's why I'm a <laughs> keynote speaker. You know, that means you're hearing 300 no's for those 60 yeses. How do you get comfortable with that? Is it just over time you get used to it and you have those practices where, all right, it isn't personal. What does that look like? It's a little bit of both. Yeah. No, it, I do. Be, I can talk myself off the ledge now <laughs> because there are times where it does sting or you do feel like it's personal um, or, or someone kind of led you to believe, yeah, I'll, I'll be able to do that interview. Just check back with me. Yeah, it's going to be. Yeah. yeah j-, and then all of a sudden you don't hear from them ever again. So yeah, but I've, I've learned to be okay. We talked earlier in the car about sitting with uncomfortable mm-hmm. feelings. So yeah, I can just lean into that and, and try not to take it personal. And yeah, you do kind of inoculate yourself to it and you build up a thick skin, but that, that's the way that it is. And, and I, I said it before and I'll say it again. I have my preferences in life, but it's not the world's job to meet my preferences. It's my job to adjust to the world around me, you know? It is my preference that no cars are ever in my way whenever I'm driving somewhere. (laughs) That is a preference of mine. I live in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. That rarely happens. There is traffic most of the time. So it's not my preference, but I'm not going to change anything by getting upset by it. So if I, if I reach out to you two to interview you for my next book and you guys politely decline, getting upset is not going to change that outcome. It's not going to get you to reverse your decision. So the only person I'd be punishing by getting upset and been, getting bent out of shape is myself. And trust me, I've done plenty of that, but it doesn't help. So you just learn to just kind of move on. And I find that time is a great healer. I, use, I play it by a 24-hour rule. So I allow myself to, to be down in the dumps, to be in my feelings, to pout, to complain, to kick and scream for 24 hours when things don't go my way. And then we're on to the next play. That's it. Move on to the next play. So yes, I feel dis. I'm not a robot. I feel yeah. disappointment just like everybody else, but I learned to process it. I learned to move on. And then I try to navigate my life in a way. How can I lessen the occurrence of other people's disappointment? If you guys reach out to have me on your show again, and I politely decline, which I never would, I'll do this anytime you guys want. But if I were to politely decline, you still may choose to be disappointed and you have the right to do that but I don't want to give you any extra ammo for doing it by, by being rude or disingenuous or not, res- not responding to you. So I've learned to focus on what's on my side of the fence. And I try to tend to my yard to the best of my ability as consistently as possible. Yeah. That's about all you can do. That's how you explain stress in your book too. Mm-hmm. I love, love, love the way you break it down of control the controllables. And it's the meaning that you give the event that you yes. have the choice. So let's talk about why that's so hard for people to recognize that their stress is really their choice. Uh, imagine this. I actually learned something on Twitter the other day. Uh, <laughs> somebody helped me clarify a statement because I did say something that was factually incorrect. And he corrected me in a very kind and professional way. We had a nice dialogue. So I need to amend my statement that stress is a choice. It's feeling stressed is a choice. There, there is a, an automatic and required stress response mm-hmm. If a, if a bear were to come barreling through your front door right now, we would feel a massive rush of adrenaline. Like we, we need that to stay safe. So there are certain responses to stressors that are unavoidable, but whether or not we choose to let those run our lives and shoot. So when people walk around saying, I'm feeling so stressed, they're not really talking about the stress responses that life throws mm-hmm. at us. They're basically saying they have an inability to cope with their feelings and their emotions, which I understand. And I've been there. So I have massive compassion for them, but that's ultimately what they're talking about. So as I clarify, feeling stressed is absolutely a choice and it's something that we invite and um, none of us are immune to it, but we can drastically decrease the chance of feeling overwhelmed and feeling stress by how we choose to respond to what's going on in the world. The world is going to do what the world is going to do. There are going to be events and circumstances. People are going to say things. People are going to do things that don't align with our preferences and we wish things were differently. But if we resist what's going on in the world, our stress goes up. If we have some level of acceptance and some level of, some level of surrender, 
then the stress just kind of passes through us. And that's, this doesn't mean we condone things. I, I want to make sure that nothing gets taken out of context. There are plenty of things in this world that go on that are borderline evil. And I'm not saying that we accept that those things are going on and that it's okay these group, this group of people is being hurt or marginalized. I'm not saying that that is okay. I'm saying that just resisting what is and fighting with reality is a fight that you can't win. And the more you push back on reality, the more you feel stressed in the moment. That's what I'm learning to get better at. So I no longer focus on circumstances, events, what people say and what people do. I put my focus on my response to those things. And I want my response to be intentional. I want it to be purposeful. I want it to be thoughtful. And I want it to move me forward and move me in the right direction. And yeah. that takes patience, something else I've struggled with. It takes awareness. I already admit that I've had struggle with. And, and it, it takes the ability to lean into being uncomfortable. I've gotten much, much, much better in my life at being comfortable at being uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, I think too, it keeps going back to what you talk about in this book are the, the fundamentals of what helps me be aware and pause? What helps me take the second to not get worked up and be able to respond? So like, what are those things you do that have gotten you to that place where you can take a second before you get feeling all stressed? This is going to sound so foo-foo and I'm not a foo-foo kind of guy, but the universe will give you plenty of opportunities to practice whatever it is that you need to practice. And Anything that used to trigger me in the past and get me bent out of shape and get me frustrated, I've learned to take a deep breath and now look at it as a gift because it's the universe's way of saying you get a chance to practice. So you're running a little bit late to pick up your kid from soccer. You have to run in to grab some Gatorades at Target. There's only one cashier open and they are moving incredibly slow. Borderline room temperature IQ. They're not moving very fast. And that used to really frustrate me. Now I take a deep breath and go, here's a, here's a repetition to practice patience. Here's a repetition to practice compassion. Here I am worried about me getting my Gatorade to see my kid. What about this person? What's going on in their day? Maybe they're moving slow because they're having a really rotten day. And we never take the time to think about those things. So now this is a chance to practice. And I need all of the practice I can get. Thankfully, the universe is helping me out because it throws everything at me that it possibly, it possibly can. And that's okay. So I've learned, and I'm glad that makes you guys smile because I spent a good deal of my life just laughing at myself because mm -hmm. I literally am standing in the line at Target and I'm feeling my heart rate accelerate. I'm feeling my blood pressure go up. I'm getting antsy. I'm bouncing. I'm like, Alan, you need to relax. Here's a chance to practice being patient. Here's a chance to practice being compassionate. And those are things we can never get enough practice of. So now anything that triggers me, instead of looking at it through the victim lens, which I've always done of why is this happening to me? I can't believe I'm going to be late getting my Gatorade to go see my kid. Me, not, me, yeah, me, 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 me. A me monster. Instead of worrying about me, I just say, great, here's a chance to practice patience, yeah. you know, and it's. And sometimes it takes a few seconds to click in. Mm -hmm. Some days I'm really good at it. Some days not so good. But I've also learned to give myself some grace and not hold myself to a yardstick of perfection. I'm allowed to be in bad moods. I'm allowed to have an off day. I'm allowed to be frustrated when I'm in the back of the line at Target. But I'm not allowed to let that dictate my behavior. So I work very hard to make sure that no matter how frustrated I feel, that I'll never be disrespectful to someone else. I'll never diminish them. I'll, you know... And as you know, in particular, kids will test that, you know, kids, kids, they can find that soft spot that you got and they can find a way to really test that. So, so kids also add to the, the practice of patience and the practice of compassion. So trying to get better at it. Yeah. I think it's funny because you can relate to it. We all have those tendencies of when we get all pissed or worked up. And I think that's a good skill though, is to kind of laugh about, well, here I go again. I'm got to work on my patience again. I'm so bad at this. And you can kind of have some humor with it too. I don't think it has to be like, God, I suck at being patient. You know, it's like, this is a lesson. This is something that I'm working on. And yeah, like you said, kids will teach you. Yeah. And, and you just, you just said it so insightfully and so perfectly, like just, just say, there I go again, mm -hmm. you know, and I have to say that a lot because there are so many of these qualities earlier in my life that I'm very thankful that I'm aware of now and that I've leveled up but they're still inside of me. They still make up who I am. You know, now I'm just aware of them and can course correct. But yes, when I find myself reverting to previous behaviors that don't serve me, that is literally what I say. Here you go again. That's the <laughs> old, that's the old Alan. Of course. I absolutely. You said that too, because we, 
it's okay to be grumpy. It's okay of to, course. to have an off day. Like you get your period or you like somebody's you're grieving. Someone just died or you're having troubles in your marriage. Like it's okay to be off. Like you don't have to beat yourself up if, if you're feeling that in your body. But I think what you're talking about is like the awareness of it and to f- notice it. Right. Yes. And to stay there is a choice. Yes. And it's, it's okay to not be okay. Doesn't feel good. Not your preference. If you guys ask me, would I prefer to feel good or prefer to feel lousy? I'm voting for good every single time, but you really can't have feeling good without feeling lousy. You know, these things are, you have to have Mm -hmm. both, you know, sunshine doesn't feel as great unless you've had a couple of rainy days. Like we have to be able to, we have to experience both. Um, I, I tweeted something the other day. All emotions are okay. All behaviors aren't. So there's nothing wrong with, and I choose not to label emotions as good or bad because I don't think feeling angry, jealous, upset, annoyed, frustrated, irritated. I don't think those are bad until you attach an emotional connotation to them. They're, they're a very human response. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, you know, if, if, if you walked outside right now and you saw somebody being rude to one of your children, anger is an appropriate response to that. Like you should feel angry as their mama bear. That should be how you feel. Now that does not give you the right to have certain behaviors. There are certain behaviors that you can do in response to that, that would either be appropriate or inappropriate. So um, a a friend of mine, who's the mental performance coach for the San Francisco giants um, in major league baseball uh, said, "Our, our emotions are designed to inform us. They're not designed to direct us. That was a game changer for me. Mm -hmm. So it's just information. I'm feeling really irritated right, right now. Okay. I'm allowing myself to feel irritated. Why Mm -hmm. am I feeling irritated? And it is very rarely what's on the surface. I'm not irritated that the the cashier at Target's a little bit slow. I'm irritated by something that's much deeper rooted. And in this case, it's it's kind of a self-righteousness that my agenda is more important than anybody else's. So when you're going slow, you're throwing a wrench in my day. So it's, and that is a deep rooted insecurity. So I have to remember, they're not the one that's causing that. They're just the trigger that's reminding me that I still have something unresolved inside of me that I need to, to still fix. And that's, that's the game changer. So I let myself feel however I'm going to feel. And I have these talks with my children all the time. I mean, especially when my twin sons were younger. I mean, I, I say it somewhat to be comical, but there's a lot of truth to it. Luke, you are allowed to be upset. You're not allowed to punch Jack in the throat. <laughs> Those two things are separate. They're different. You know, and then we, we've had this discussion too. You know, Jack will come out and he'll be from his room and he'll be crying. This was years ago. He'd be like, Luke's making me mad. I said, Luke's not making you anything. You're choosing to be mad and you have every right to choose that, but don't give your power away. Mm. He's not making you do anything. You get to choose and, and you have every right to choose what you want to choose, but then you have to be very careful on what you choose as a response to that. And We've had some some good discussions over that. I love yeah. that. I, I think it's a beautiful reframe too. Your trigger is an invitation to dig deeper. And every time you're triggered, the universe is saying, hey, it's time to work on this. Hey, now's your time to turn inward and say, hmm, what's going on? And like I had this crazy moment yesterday where I was going for a walk and my boyfriend's about to move out and do a year on his own. And I'm like, why am I so upset with this? I'm like, it, it, there's a deeper ruining. I'm like, because anytime a man gets close, AKA my father, he leaves. I'm like, holy shit. It was like this light bulb moment of this is how you're really feeling. And this is why you're shutting down. Cause that's what you do to protect yourself. It's like these protector parts in you, but just to slow down and be open of why am I feeling like this? The boundary boss we had on yeah. Terry Cole with boundaries too. And it's, why are you feeling this way? what is that trying to tell you that you are ready to work on? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's beautiful that reframe the invitation to go deeper and to know that don't give your power away by being upset. You said that perfectly. Yes. And then this parlays to just basic concepts of repetition is not punishment. Mm -hmm. Repetition is the oldest and most effective form of learning and skill acquisition on the planet. And that is never going to change. So if you want to get better at not shutting down, then you need to get in as many repetitions as you can at things that would previously cause you to shut down. And then you have to learn how to sit with them. Um, and it's no different than the physiological. I mean, if anyone that does any type of, of cold plunge or cold showers or cold therapy, it's incredibly uncomfortable. And I don't know that anyone ever gets, you know, gets to the point where it's, it's enjoyable. And if, if they do, please 
shoot me a DM on Instagram. I'd like to meet you because you're borderline psychotic. Um, but you do learn to tolerate it yes. and you do learn to accept it. And you do learn to say, you know, me complaining and belly aching and saying this is cold isn't going to make this cold shower any more pleasurable or go by any quicker. Or less cold. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things that I've tried to condition myself to do, and there was a gentleman named Trevor Moad who, who passed away last year, who wrote an amazing book called It Takes What It Takes, um, used to work for Nick Saban uh, down at Alabama. I really enjoyed the book. And, and he said something that I, I conveniently stole from him, and that is do not say anything out loud that doesn't serve you. Mm. So you can't really control whether you think it, but you can control whether or not you say it. So there's no sense in saying, oh my God, this water's so cold. Yeah, we know it's a cold shower. Of course it's cold. That's the goal. But saying it isn't going to make your situation any better. And we were talking earlier uh, during the workout about some marathons and, and I was talking about some negative self-talk that I had during the first marathon and I was verbalizing it. I was taking negative self-talk and I was giving it a megaphone because I was literally say, muttering out, out loud to myself, there's no way I can finish. I can't believe you're walking. This is, oh my God, I'll never be able to get running again. I don't know that I'm going to finish. You don't need to give it power. It's bad enough to think those things, but we don't have full control over what comes in and out of our brains, but we don't have to give it extra power by saying it out loud. So that's one of the biggest teaching points I use with my children currently is I hold them accountable anytime they say something that doesn't serve them. I'm like, you don't have to say that out loud. Well, you're reaffirming yeah. it. Yes. You're putting it out in the universe. And then what you say, the universe is then giving you proof that that's true, right? Like, Bingo. God, I'm so broke. Okay. There's another reason I'm broke. There's another one. Yep. Okay. And so speak what you want into existence. That's what I believe. But that's, that's tough. It's Oh, conditioning it and doing it again and again and again. That's yes. the power of repetition. And, and this is where you have to learn to quickly move to the next play. So if I do find myself saying something out loud that doesn't serve me, catch myself doing it, give myself some grace and, and permission to make mistakes, but then just don't repeat it. I don't need to stack shame and guilt on top of the fact that I just messed up. Now that makes it even worse. Now it's even heavier. So I shouldn't have said that. Now I feel shameful and guilty for saying that now it's this this emotional cocktail that's making me feel even worse so yeah i said what i said it didn't serve me i just won't say it again oh, and just just move on next play this. i think this is so powerful and you talk about it in your book i think it's steph curry that is really notorious for moving on to the next play right he's genius at it i would love for you to talk about this because i i have a tough inner critic that replays things i've said or done that mm -hmm. that i beat myself up about and i do you know, have self growth techniques and I do have good fundamentals that help me grow, but I still go back and I think about those things that drives me nuts. So what is the psychology behind and benefits of the next play? Well, first and foremost, I hope you know you, you do that because you're human. <laughs> yeah. Or at least from what I can tell you're yeah, human. Yeah. It's uh, that's part of the human condition and that's a game that, that we all play. So for me, can I do it less frequently than I've done in the past. I mean, we're all going to replay things, especially when something doesn't unfold our way. And we're like, oh, if I just would have said this, or I just would have done this, maybe I would have got a different outcome. Um, I've had to learn how to do that, especially from like a keynote standpoint. Now, my goal today is do the best job that I'm capable of when I'm on stage later. If, if you ask me my preference, my preference is this will be the best keynote that I've ever given in my life. And I know that that's a very high bar. I also know that no matter how good it goes or how well it goes, whichever is correct using the English. I just learned to speak English the other day. So if you guys could, if you could please be patient, um, no matter how well it goes, I promise you, I can still step off stage and go, I could have said that then I could have had better timing here. Like there's no such thing as perfection. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to learn how to just let what is just let it be. And then try and focus on moving to that, that next play. And that is for me, that is something I actually do say to myself all of the time. Next play. I mean, the other part about giving a keynote is there are plenty of times where I mess up, but the audience doesn't know because you don't know what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, in real time, when I go, I can't believe I forgot to make that point earlier. You don't know that I didn't make the point because I didn't make it, but I know in my head. So if I allow myself to get rattled and frazzled over what I didn't say, it's going to detract from what I'm doing in the moment. So now in real time, I'm saying, okay, when would be an appropriate time to put that point in where it would still make sense and have some context? So a lot of the mistakes that we make, they're in the unseen hours. No one would have any idea. So there's no sense in beating ourselves up. Mm -hmm. But I say next play to myself a lot and, and it needs to be. I, I wanted to speak at this engagement. They politely said no, next play. I think that also helps with the perfectionist mindset. 
-hmm. right? You can't be perfect. And so when you do mess up, okay, next play progress, just keep moving forward. Yeah. So what, what are your thoughts on perfectionism and how in your book, you talk about progression over and striving for excellence. And so how do we make that switch for the perfectionists out there? I believe perfectionism is, a, is from a deep-rooted insecurity that I'm unworthy, I'm not enough, so the only chance I have is to be perfect, that the only way I can earn somebody's love or affection is if I'm perfect at it. And, then, and that usually stems from folks, we were talking about this earlier as well, when you learn to uh, uh, attach your self-worth and self-belief to achievement. So when I get straight A's, I'm good. When I make the basketball team, I'm good, you know, whatever it may be. And we have to learn that we're, we're good unconditionally. Those things can be preferences. They can be things we strive for. There's nothing wrong with getting straight A's or making the basketball team, but it doesn't mean you're less of a human being when you fall short of those ideals. And this is where we have to be very careful as parents is not to recondition that with our children and make sure that they understand that too. So first of it, it comes with the untethering of performance and who we are. Now, as I said, my goal is to do the best that I'm capable of at today's keynote. I want to do that for myself because they have pride in my work. I want to do that because I'm a professional and I'm being paid to deliver and, and give something. But if for any reason today goes off the rails and is not a great keynote, it doesn't mean I'm any less of a human being. It means I, I effed up. I, I had a swing at bat and I struck out. And I'm going to do everything I can to prepare so the chance of that happening is significantly decreased. But that's, that's just the way that, that life unfolds. So perfectionism... Um, I think is a deep rooted insecure. We have to learn how to let go of perfect. I also don't believe, and, and I'm someone that comes from sports. I believe I love games, but I would never play a game that I have 0% chance of winning. That doesn't sound very fun to me. I mean, I'm not a gambler, but at least if you go to Vegas and you play roulette, you know, you got a, what, a 50% <laughs> chance of winning. I mean, they're not great or 49. I think technically not great odds, but at least you got a shot. Why play something that you have a 0% chance of winning? you have a 0% chance of living a perfect life. I mean, look at the game of basketball. Since the inception, since, since Naismith invented the game, there has never been a perfect game played. A perfect game would mean not a single missed shot, not a single turnover, like perfection. That has never been done. And we have some really good people that play the game of basketball. So why play a game that you can't win? You can't win the perfectionist game. You also can't win the comparison game. So I stopped playing that a few years ago as well. You know, we, we were talking about how we may view different people by many metrics of success, outside metrics of success. If I compare myself to Ed Milet, I come out on the losing end of that in many ways, but that's okay. Cause I don't use those to determine my self-worth and that, that I think is, and that's tough because I have mm -hmm. in the past and, and it's hard not to allow that, you know, but I I've learned if I were to walk outside right now and throw a rock, I could promise you. I'll hit somebody that's taller, has better abs, has more money, has a nicer house, has more Instagram followers, probably not funnier, let's be honest. But generally speaking, every single metric, external metric you could think of, it would take me three seconds to find someone that's beating me in any of those categories. So there's no sense in, in playing that game. And, and, and that, I mean, even look at the one I use all the time, LeBron James, a once in a generation athlete, unbelievable in every regard. And he still can't even escape being compared to Michael Jordan. No matter what he does, he's still being compared. Mm -hmm. You know, I always say that, you know, uh, Damian Lillard just signed a new contract with the Portland Trailblazers for a hundred and uh, I think he's making $62 million a year. So 120 million for two years. Same. It's, it's the highest. Yeah. It's the highest per season salary of any of the American professional sports. That's a lot of money. You know who has more money? The guy that's signing his check, <laughs> the owner of the Portland Trailblazers has infinitely more money than he does. So anytime you try to compare based on external metrics, you will easily find someone that's beating you. And if that makes you feel less than, then that is not a game to play. Hear the rest of our interview with Alan Stein Jr. this Thursday, September 15th, where he dives deep into burnout, grind culture, and abundance mindset, and made our abs hurt from laughing so hard. This is Gold Ivy signing off. Listen to your truth and go chase your gold.